Hi, I'm Frank. I take care of the greenhouse here. I'm the horticulturist in the greenhouse at Bowling Green State University. And I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, a few examples of the plants that relate to the section for your lab today. We're going to take a tour around the greenhouse. We'll start here in the desert area. We have a lot of different cacti and succulents that you can see throughout the greenhouse. And uh, our typical, our green or desert setting is, is much more populated than a natural desert would be. Desert conditions, as we all know, are typically hot and dry and have lots of temperature change. Um, cold nights as well as the hot days, but typically a lack of moisture and the plants have to adapt to these different conditions. A lot of us are familiar with typical cactus. Um, people don't realize a lot of times that the spines of the cactus are actually leaves with reduced area so that they don't have as much exposure to the sunlight and therefore the stem becomes the photosynthetic part of the plant. And uh, these plants are able to store water in the stem as well which makes that a multifunctional organ of the plant for support, um, photosynthesis and water storage. A uh, number of other plants we have in here have a high density of spines that can act to reflect sunlight or others that have different characteristics such as say a waxy cuticle like this succulent that helps to retain the moisture that's within the plant. And you can see that waxy cuticle that wipes off that uh, protects that plant from evaporation. They also retain a lot of moisture within them and you can see as I squeeze that the moisture comes out of that. So this environment is uh, really harsh and there's a lot of exposure with the sun. There's really nowhere to hide so these plants have, have dealt with that. Um, other plants, let's see, have a kind of a, a leathery texture. Um, some of them will even have a, a hairy texture like this velvet leaf and these little hairs will help to reflect the sunlight, keep the plant from uh, too much exposure. Let's see, there's a few different plants in here that look a lot like cactus. This plant here typically would be, to most people, considered to look like a cactus, but it's really a euphorbia. And this is an example of convergent evolution where a plant is totally unrelated but evolved in the same environment has taken on a similar form of another plant. So in this case, it's a euphorbia compared to a cactus, which looks very similar, yet is unrelated. And there's your example of convergent evolution. Soils in the desert environment are often really sandy, well draining, and don't seem to have a lot of organic material. Therefore, it could be thought of how different uh, levels of bacteria and fungi might or might not be present based on the structures of the soil. So we'll compare this to the soil in the tropical environment and uh, use those for comparisons for different levels of bacteria that we're going to look at throughout the lab. Welcome to the tropical environment. We've got a great example of a lot of different species of plants. You can see the high diversity of plants per square meter in this environment, which is a replication of what a tropical forest would be like. Typically, tropical forests have about 79 inches or more of rain per year and temperatures between 25 and 35 degrees Celsius usually consisting of the upper canopy, the canopy, the subcanopy, the shrub, and the ground layer. And they're all filled with plants at different levels taking up any niche they can find to exist throughout this 
ecosystem. Here we've got large banana plant. It's got big leaves. We've got uh, a number of other plants throughout here. A number of bromeliads, which grow as epiphytes. An epiphyte is a plant that grows on another plant. Basically, it's getting access to sunlight and a place to grow throughout this environment because down near the forest floor, there's usually a small amount of sunlight that makes it through and it's usually quite shaded. So some plants like the banana in this environment here or some of these others will have large leaves to capture the sunlight that does get through. And the plants like the bromeliad will grow on the other plants and they are what's called an epiphyte, which they're just getting a place to live to get access to sunlight as compared to a parasite, which actually steals nutrients from its host plant, these guys are just getting a place to, to live. Vines will also grow up to get out to the edge of the sunlight to capture that without having to support a big trunk for themselves. So they're able to uh, use minimal energy to get up and capture the, uh, the sunlight. So those are some cool things. Um, we can walk around and look at a few different examples of plants here. We have a couple of Bilbergia bromeliads in bloom right now. They're really quite spectacular. Another one is the urn plant. These urn plants hold water in little cups in the center of the plant. And it's said that dart frogs will put tadpoles in there and they'll raise, raise their young in there in those little pools of water. And that can happen at many levels throughout the canopy. Another Epiphyte is Spanish moss. We've got a lot of that growing in here, just kind of hanging around, as well as a number of orchids. We've got some different orchids throughout the greenhouse that are epiphytes as well. We've got uh, a lot of other plants in here that are representative of this biome, including, like I said, some vines, this mandevilia. We've got uh, um, bird of paradise plant over here with big flowers. This is the Swiss cheese plant here. This is another plant that's got large leaves to capture the sunlight that does make it through. And it's thought that this plant has the holes to expand the leaf area so that the uh, leaf can capture more sunlight. Let's say numbers of ferns throughout here and uh, lots of interesting plants. Some of the plants within this area have shallow roots. If we think about the bacteria or the uh, nutrients in this system, there's a lot of biomass, and this biomass all has to be broken down, and the bacteria and fungi tend to break that down and turn that into nutrients. And there's so many plants here that there's oftentimes a lot of competition for those nutrients, and so the plants tend to be shallow rooted to maximize the absorption of the nutrients that are available. Sometimes these soils can be unstable as well and some of them will be buttressed or flared at the base and that's going to help to support the plants in the soil that's usually really wet, potentially unstable. Um, prop roots are another. This plant here you can see the Dracaena has these prop roots to help stabilize it. And uh, if you would look here, you can see the base of the ficus. Then it has a little bit of the buttressing to where you can see where it's flared to help support that plant. Um, here's another plant, the staghorn fern. This is growing on this other plant as an epiphyte, as well as there's a couple of orchids in here and vines. And these are uh, different. Um, examples of how they would grow in nature here. You can see how it just clings to the tree and with a complex relationship with fungi they're able to absorb nutrients in a more efficient manner with minimal uh, soil. There's a neat hibiscus flower that you can see. Um, a number of orchids over here and many orchids are actually specialized to one pollinator that might visit them one of those examples would be this vanilla orchid. The vanilla orchid has a specific pollinator in Mexico, there's a small bee, and everywhere else vanilla is grown, somebody has to hand pollinate the flowers. And we had this bloom this past summer, and we've got a few 
vanilla beans growing right here on the vine that we pollinated by hand to uh, produce vanilla. That's one of the reasons why it's so expensive is because it's very labor intensive to produce. Uh, okay, hi. We're back in the other part of the greenhouse where we house our carnivorous plants. We have a small collection. Um, most people are familiar with carnivorous plants by Venus flytraps for the most part. And Venus flytraps are very unique that are in the fact that they capture insects and they use the insects to help supplement the fact that they um, exist in bogs and areas with really poor nutrients in their soil. One of the reasons they have poor nutrients is the fact that the acidity of the soils prevents a lot of bacterial growth. And without the bacterial growth, nothing's decomposed, therefore there's no nutrients released and the plants don't get a lot from that soil. So they've evolved to capture insects over time and we're gonna trigger one of these plants to show you guys how this mechanism works. The uh, traps all have little trigger hairs and if you touch a trigger hair once, it doesn't close. But if you touch a trigger hair multiple times or multiple trigger hairs, then the trap will close and capture the insect. Then it will extract the nutrients and the uh, minerals from those insects and it'll help that plant thrive. So in addition to the Venus flytrap, which is unique to the United States, it's a North American native from North Carolina, is the only place in the world where it grows. A lot of people don't know that. Um, there's also another, another plant we'll look at here. It's called the sundew. And here's a sundew, which has lots of sticky little hairs on it, little drops that that look like dew in the sun that's where it gets its name and they're super sticky and when a bug lands on this they become entangled in this and the plant will curl over and touch the bug with more surface area to absorb the nutrients from that bug as well so this is the cape sundew and there's also a uh, flat leaf sundews like you can see here same type of uh, mechanism to capture their prey so they are some of my favorites, all the carnivorous plants. And other carnivorous plants we have here are the pitcher plants. You can see the pitcher plant. This one's Saracenia, the North American pitcher plant. And the insects are attracted to um, some nectar and odors that come from the plant. And they're trapped within here and it's very slippery. And the further down they go, they encounter the little hairs that force the bugs into the bo bottom of the plant where enzymes break that plant down and the nutrients are absorbed from there. Um, besides these plants, we have the tropical pitcher plants. You can see a number of them here. And that's where they really get the name pitcher plant as they look like a pitcher. These have enzymes inside them as well. And the insects go inside and get trapped you can see those enzymes and the liquid in there and when they get trapped and drowned and decompose the plant will absorb the remnants of that um, so that's a little tour of our greenhouse if you get a chance stop by and if we're able we'll show you around if we're not busy and hope you enjoyed this thanks take one of our saracenia north american pitcher plants we're going to open it up and see what we find in here. The insects are drawn in and this top area is very slippery and as they come down farther they encounter this hairy spot where all the hairs point downwards and force the bugs that struggle deeper within the plant and as they're forced deeper they'll encounter the enzymes that break them down. Whoa there's a live bee in there or a wasp I just released him he is not Ooh. happy that's crazy so that's his lucky day if he can make it let's see what else is down in the rest of this picture plant <laughs> there's a number of decomposed insects within the base of this plant that uh, we're going to give it some supplemental nutrition in addition to the poor soils in which they've evolved to live in so that's the saracenia opened up